I'd like to, to start by acknowledging the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation as traditional owners of the land on which my institution sits and recognise their elders, past, present and future, um, and their continuing connection with the land. I'd also like to acknowledge um, the custodial catering um, and cleaning staff who prepare this facility uh, for us today. And I do that because if we're going to talk about public engagement, um, then we need to think about the people who are systematically excluded from the conversations we have. And one way to do that is to acknowledge the labour and the capital um, that we depend on um, to do our work. So I hope with that, I've got a little bit past the initial reaction of what's the white Anglophone middle-class middle-aged guy doing talking about neo-colonialism. Um, I want to talk about something that's in a sense really simple, um, but it requires a, a bunch of sort of underpinning assumptions that I suspect many of you make to be broken down to get there. Um, I'm going to focus mainly in the parallel space of academic research, but as I said yesterday, I think there's so many parallels here, and I'll try and come back to that at the end. So I want to focus on this notion of excellence. What is it that makes excellent research? Um, and if this is one of the values of the academy, which is a claim that is often made, um, how can we find it and how can we understand it? Going back to, I think it was, as Lucas at the beginning said, um, if you want to do public engagement properly, then it needs to be embedded in your values and your mission. So similarly, if we're going to understand what universities and academic researchers think of as excellence, then maybe we could start by looking at mission statements to provide the kind of clarity we might look for. So if we look for the word excellence in the context of university mission statements, we'll see a commitment to excellence. Um, we'll see universities, my own university, will strive for excellence and distinction. Um, I don't know why that's repeated. Um, Cape Peninsula University of Technology in South Africa prizes excellence. The university of Winston demands excellence. Some institutions just have excellence. They just kind of have the self-confidence to say, yeah, whatever, obviously. And it's really interesting that you see this correlates with a number of things, obviously, wealth, nation, distance from Boston. Um, <laughs> but none of these things tell us about what this excellence is in. What is it excellence of? What is excellence for? So if we look a little bit deeper, that we see things like excellence in a particular kind, professionally relevant teaching from some institutions. Um, research and education is a very common formulation, very similar at Cornell and very similar at my university. Um, sometimes you feel that universities are reaching a little bit for something they can claim excellence in. Um, here, a centre for cultural, athletic and other events, but that's the nature of the US university system, I suppose. But we've still got no real idea of what we're measuring, what we're seeing, what are we doing? What is any of this for? Again, let's look a little deeper. UC Davis, they measure their excellence by saying that faculty have earned prestigious honours. So you're getting prizes for getting prizes now, okay. Uh, rankings, rankings are very important. I know rankings are a controversial area in this community as well. Pursuing excellence means being satisfied with no less than the highest goals we can envision. Again, goals for what? For who? Who is being served here? What is the purpose? This is what interesting, being informed by regional, national and global standards, as well as our personal expectations. So again, you see a stratification of universities based on whether they're comparing themselves to regional groups, to national groups or internationally. Um, in the UK, the government's policy on uh, core funding is that only research of international relevance and standing is worthy of funding. Which is interesting if you ask the question, does the UK therefore not have any local issues that require research? So Michelle Lebon's probably one of the most interesting scholars of this question of academic excellence. And, and this is the first sentence of her book, How Professors Think, that excellence is the holy grail of academic life. It's produced and defined in a multitude of sites and by an array of actors. Jack Stilgo, a little bit more pithily in, um, in his essay Against Excellence, says, excellence tells us nothing about how important the science is and everything about who is making that decision. 
What have we learned? Basically nothing. What we've learned is that excellence is an example of a particular kind of word that we deploy when we want to avoid having a conversation. Because that conversation is difficult. Because it's a conversation about values. Other words that have occurred over the last few days that might fall into this category include impact, evidence, data, methodology, uh, quality is another one, um, and possibly think tanks. So this is a problem, right? So we don't know what we're talking about. As an academic, as Erin was, was discussing with me earlier, if we don't know how to define something, then we get stuck. We don't know where to go. Um, but actually, in many ways, it doesn't matter. Um, definition is a question more of methodology than it is of ontology. It's a way of choosing what we include in our studies. So maybe we don't need to worry too much about what it really means and simply to observe that it's, a, that it's a shared thing that has a multitude of characteristics. That'd be nice. Unfortunately, it's not true. Because the behavioural psychology tells us something quite distinctive. That when you have these non-shared conceptions of performance, and particularly when you use quantitative and ranking-based and zero-sum approaches to defining who's doing it well, then you get people performing against the proxies, against the things that determine where you're ranked or whether you get the money, rather than actually doing the job they're after. And what you get is a bunch of middle-aged, English-speaking white men based in the UK and in North America being invited to come and tell you about how you're doing everything wrong. So you get this performance of excellence, which becomes part of the process, not just of what is done and how it is done, what is acceptable methodology, what is, what is high quality approaches to evidence gathering and communication. How do we do public engagement? Not just the questions of process, but the questions of who, and what they look like, and what they sound like. And this comes to replace the diversity of excellent performance of valuable things and a value that's been created in the many very different sites that matter. And in, again, in this community, where we've heard that, yes, it's what's in common that is becoming very valuable, but it's the fact that what's in common is coming from so many different regional, demographic, and disciplinary perspectives that makes it a value. Now, of course, I don't do this at all. Um, this is the paper that was maybe the first one um, that, we, that we sort of wrote about this. Um, this is the comment of one of my co-authors that was doing really great numbers on Facebook. Really doing great downloads. So you were asking the other day about social media um, and measuring performance. So we've got really good social media numbers. Um, this is the highest number that any article in this journal, in fact, I think any article in the humanities, uh, got in 2017. Um, it's a great number, right? It's more than 500. Must be good. Um, actually, I mean, this, this is perhaps a little bit more contextual. It's in the 99th percentile of 333,000 articles of a similar age in all journals published. Um, and this is a fun one. It's in the 93rd percentile of the articles published in the same time in the same journal. 93rd percentile, which means it's the top because there's only 16 of them. So if you're looking for some more traditional metrics, because obviously the more traditional a metric is, the more you can trust it. Yeah, right? Oh, that's obviously true. Um, we have 21 citations. Again, very high for a humanities article a year or so after publication. We'll just gloss over the fact that in Web of Science that number's actually zero and I'll move straight on. The point being, um, we're all guilty of this. Um, this is part of the conditioning that we work in in the academy and you, you have the same kinds of questions around levels of income or prestige of who's picking up your reports or where you're sitting in some of these rankings. Okay. So excellence is contextual. Great, the humanist comes up and tells you it's all about context. Brilliant. That's, that's helpful. Um, it's also dangerous. I've made the case that it's 
this is not just something where we sort of gloss over it because we have a shared kind of ish kind of understanding, but what's important is we all agree it's important. It's actually really dangerous to have as a core construct in your community a concept which is ill-defined precisely because you will get someone who will sell you numbers that de facto define that quality for you. And again, in the academy, it might be citations, it might be journal impact factors, it might be the publisher of your book. And those things come to replace the content of your work. My colleagues tell me when they've published a nature paper. They don't tell me what the title of the paper is because that's not important for their promotion, for their next grants, and for their future career. What has this got to do with anything to do with neo-colonial? And, and particularly, what has it got to do with the neo? So, knowledge production in a post-colonial context, which is to say most of the world, so 85% of the world's population, and therefore the most important part of it, um, is for what? It's, it's done by governments funding sometimes to create international profile, international prestige, in the same way that we fund sports teams or ballets or arts, perfectly reasonable, for solving local problems of importance, for creating that capacity to solve it, for absorptive capacity, this notion that if you have local expertise, then you can draw on research from other places and you need that capacity because knowledge is in some senses a use good. It's more valuable the more you use it. Um, also, honestly, for pure Keynesian economics, just you know, let's get some economic activity happening. Research is actually really good at that. And it's actually one of the major, major economic impacts of research, but we don't like to talk about that too much. It doesn't matter what you fund, just fund it um, if you're a central bank. But it's resource intensive, right? Research is expensive. It involves expensive people doing expensive things in expensive buildings often travelling in expensive ways to expensive conferences. So it needs to be done well if you're going to invest limited resources. And so what does it mean for it to be done well? This is a question that's important for a government, for a funder. And is there the local capacity to tell? Now this is a sort of fundamental question. Do you have the confidence in a post-colonial setting where that confidence was part of what was systematically destroyed by colonialism? to make those choices and to do those things for yourself. And again, speaking as the person who is invited to South America and South Africa and Southern Africa and Southeast Asia to tell people how they should measure research excellence. And my usual thing is to say, well, the person who just spoke, who's from your local university, who sits in the office next door to you, what they're doing, that's excellent. And that's my job is to come in and tell people that they should have the confidence to see the excellence in their own spaces. That's not a good sign, um, because that really needs to come ultimately internally. So that's fine. This is still post-colonial analysis. This is classical dependency theory with all the strengths and weaknesses of that kind of analysis if you're into that kind of thing. Why am I harping on about this neo-colonial point? The reason is this is a new thing. So again, if you come from the periphery, you probably have this impression that the Western Academy is a thing that has stood the test of time, that's been there for hundreds of years. It has its roots, often the narrative goes, in the Royal Society of England and the Restoration and various other interesting stories we can tell about that. It's rubbish. The notion of excellence as a quality of research like many things, including peer review, publication, and research assessment itself, is a product of the 1970s and the 1980s. Um, let me just give you one piece of sort of hand wavy data. This is a graph showing the frequency of the word excellence in the addresses of the president of the Royal Society. So this is the top, this is the elite of the elite of the elite. and they give an address each year and it's recorded. And I can do a word frequency analysis and look at the word excellent. And it really doesn't happen <laughs> until the late 1990s. Um, and in fact, if you look a little closer, um, early on, 
You might see something about the excellence of someone's work. So many of these addresses actually, back in, up until 1936, they actually included obituaries. So you talk about a person's work, their whole body of work, not the outputs, not their publications, but their overall contribution. But most of it's things like this. The excellence of British gunnery during the war, and I don't know what that's got to do with the Royal Society, something to do with engineering and, um, and mechanics and maths. Um, there's this whole th fleet of things happening in the UK in the 1960s and 70s about the formation of centres of excellence. But these are, this is an institutional argument about whether these things are actually a valuable way of doing this kind of work. Actually talking about research excellence in the abstract, in these addresses, does not happen until 1998. This is a recent theme. It's way past the independence of the countries that have a colonial legacy. It has new models and new actors. I mean, we just heard about the issue, exactly the issue Tarek was talking about with Facebook. Facebook is a neo-colonial actor, taking control, defining the institutions, removing and reducing the ability of local institutions and local communities to act through defining its control in just the same way as the East India companies in the Netherlands and the, and the UK and in England at the time did in the 17th century. And it's not an accident, in my view, that the two proprietary organisations that provide the biggest institutional form through which we measure research excellence, Web of Science and Scopus, two large companies based in Amsterdam and in London, just as the Dutch East India Company, sorry, Dutch and East India Companies were based. And doing exactly the same things, building a set of institutions and rules and infrastructures and technical systems that are built for the purposes of shareholders in Northwestern Europe and North America, built for customers to serve the interests and the concerns that have developed in Northwestern Europe and North America in terms of what's important to measure and offered at a low cost, you know, free entry to start off with to places with no customization, no thought as to whether the corpus of works, the set of things that are of interest are actually relevant beyond what I've taken to calling North Atlantic. One of the, if you take anything away from this talk, it's the notion of completely removing the word international from our lexicon. International is almost always code for Northwestern Europe and North America. If you can't replace the word international with the word global, if that feels uncomfortable, that's a sign that it's not international at all. And there are new forms of structural bias coming into this. And I, yeah, 20 minutes, 80 slides, it was always going to be a bit of a rich. Um, this is the system by which I put my work into the system so the university that I work at knows about it. Um, this is a particular technical system. It's not the fault of the company itself, but it's just the one I happen to have access to. So I'm required to get things into this system. And as long as my works are in certain places and indexed by certain providers, including Web of Science and Scopus, but also PubMed, based in the US, um, Archive, based in the US, Europe PubMed Central, based in Cambridge, um, then it's a one button. Simple, straightforward, goes straight into the system, I don't have to do any work. If it's not indexed in those systems, i.e. if it's published in pretty much any journal published out of South America, Southern Africa, MENA, or Southeast Asia, then I've got to fill in this form. This is a form of structural bias which is new and which is common. That if you fall outside the standard systems, the standard assumptions of how work is collected, how it is indexed, how it is searched for, um, you've got to put in 10 times as much work to get even to the same level of collection, curation, management and care. Here's another example, just a very quick one. Um, this is articles published from um, South Africa, published, indexed in Web of Science, because this was the easy way to do it. I appreciate the, the irony here. Um, 
graphed against the percentage contribution to mortality in South Africa. So the result of these systems is that, so you'd expect in an ideal world, that roughly speaking, the mortality burden would, would translate to being roughly proportional to the amount of effort being put into research on that topic. And you see that for HIV, for diabetes, for heart disease, mortality causes of rich people, that is true. For things that are typical or particular to South Africa, particularly road injury, um, but also diseases of poor people like diarrhea, lower respiratory tract infections, and to some extent stroke, those are getting less attention. And that is the effect, right? Lack of research and lack of research that we can argue is killing people. All right, so in my minus three minutes, um, what are we going to do about it? Anyone recognise this? Who are the Latin Americans in the room? So this is a triangle introduced by um, Sabato and Batana, two Uruguayan uh, researchers, published in 1968. So this is just over 50 years old. Um, and essentially what it's saying is if we think about development, we need to think about it in the context of three parts of society the knowledge production part of society, so the infrastructure for science and technology as they phrased it, the government, but also the industrial system, the productive system of a company, of a country. Um, and so their concern was about how does knowledge production contribute to development, but I think this helps us to understand how we need to think our way through this problem. Um, their point, the core of their point, is that it's not about the strength of the corners. It's about the balance of the contributions and their interactions in a particular context. Now, there's sort of many objections to this. I think the most obvious one, um, given that this is basically an early version of the triple helix, um, for those of you familiar with that, is that we need to add in civil society here um, in the quadruple helix sense. The other is um, that this notion that there's a sharp definition between research and government and industry and civil society, as we've heard, is not, is, there isn't that clear distinction. What we're really talking about is networks. But I'll come back to that. The point they make is, if one of these nodes is too tightly coupled to an external triangle, to the international system, that you break down the strength of connections. So the weak ties that bind the three local parts of the triangle together are easily displaced and destroyed by one of those being pushed to be too strongly connected with external and international systems. Some of you might be starting to think about what this means in terms of the internationalization of your local research systems. Okay, so as I said, this is really about networks, right? So we need to draw a picture that's a little bit more like this. Um, that there are people who bridge and organizations that bridge these gaps. There are systems that are, there's movement, there's dynamics, but also in a networked world, we can think about evaluating this. We can think about measuring some of the strengths of these connections, some of the weakness of these connections, and we can at least make some thoughtful decisions based on how our interventions might change those connections. And one of the systems that we can measure very well through these neo-colonial infrastructures um, and organisations is exactly the strength of connections between our local research establishments and the way in which they cite and are cited by the international research community. And if your local system of research evaluation privileges those connections, then you are damaging the connections that you could be making locally with civil society, government and industry. And that's what most of our research evaluation systems do, and that's what research excellence as a rhetoric promotes. A notion that this is a flat international system with standards of... Um, it's the same networks that make up airline routes. It's the same networks that make up citation patterns. So the point I want to make, this goes back to the thing about social movements, is that building the right networks requires us to institutionalise locality in some sense. If you're choosing to go out and interact with a social movement or with publics, publics plural, you're doing that because of the diversity 
of views that those groups bring. But if you network with them too strongly, you break down what makes them special. You break down what makes them different. And you break down and lose the potential for the insight and the connection you have to those communities. So there's a tension here. There's not an either or. It's a question of how do we build networks that contain with them systems that support that locality. Um, how do we build these things and thinking about the, the, the important sets of nodes is one way of doing that. Um, three more slides, I think. In the longer term, this is important because I think the peripheral areas can lead the world. Let me give you another version of the data I showed you earlier. When we look at South Africa's performance on a set of search terms to do with medical research, the number of articles that are accessible for anyone to read, they do better than the Netherlands. And the Netherlands is supposed to be the great success story. South Africa has just been quietly getting on and doing this in a way that no one was paying a huge amount of attention to. So we have to figure out how to not just do that, but also to institutionalise it. Because here's the inverse of that story. For 20 years, Latin America and Brazil were leading the world on access to the products of research out of Latin America. This just shows Brazil and shows the success that was made by local investments in a different system that had local characteristics mm -hmm. and was built on local culture. 2011, there was a government initiative to internationalise the research system and make it more coherent with the international system, and that lead was lost. So that's the thing that I want you to remember, that thinking about how we both make connections but preserve difference, how the systems we're interacting with need to have the confidence, the locality, to be able to trust themselves to make those decisions. Um, and this is really about privileging the local because we, by default, will privilege the international, the global. By default, we will allow returns to networks and returns to capital. And network effects will always drive returns to capital. If you want to preserve the qualities of difference, the qualities of diversity, and the different pockets of outstanding practice that are not found in Northwestern Europe and North America, but are found in the other parts of the world where you're not restricted in the same ways as we are, then we have to find ways to do this. Um, because that's where the confidence comes from. This, I'll leave you with this quote. This is from a colleague, Kim Scott. And what he's doing is he's repatriating recordings of Indigenous Australians made in the so written records from about the 1880s through to, and re recordings from the 1920s. And what he's done very purposefully is taken those out of the archives and given them back to the communities, to the descendants of the people who were recorded. And they have to reconstruct their language, their stories. And then sometimes they choose to make those public to a wider audience. Sometimes when they're confident to do it, when they're happy with what they've done, then they will share. And I think this is a great example of the kind of balance, kind of way in which we can approach this and the way in which we should question whenever we think there's a nice simple ranking or score we can give to anything. Um, and with that, I'll stop. Thank you.